Well, it's a great pleasure to be back at Oxford. And uh, I must say that uh, I pay tribute to the number of people who had come in on the last week of term on a sunny afternoon to listen to a lecture. And uh, uh, I don't think I would have done that when I was an undergraduate, so <laughs> my hat's just off to you. What I propose is that I will try to restrict myself, which is difficult for a professor, to about uh, uh, 30 minutes or so of laying out the argument, and then uh, to uh, spend the most of our time together on Q&A, which is actually much more fun for me. Uh, I can always bore myself speaking, to, but I am rarely bored when I hear people uh, ask questions and engage in conversation. So uh, let me, uh, with that introduction, uh, tell you that uh, our timing is really quite extraordinary to be talking about the uh, future of the liberal international order when it seems to be coming apart. Uh, if you look at the headlines in today's uh, papers, uh, with Trump leaving the group of seven meeting, not only condemning the communique that he had signed, but then insulting his host by Twitter. I mean, that's, that's different, <laughs> that's, that's new. So let me try to put all that in a context. And uh, the context is really in one in which uh, we ask ourselves uh, the question in the title, which is the so-called liberal international order, or if you prefer uh, the American uh, post-war Pax Americana, is it coming to an end? Uh, many people think it is. And uh, certainly there are uh, uh, two uh, uh, causes that uh, are often cited. One is the, uh, uh, basically the 2016 election and the behavior of President Trump. And the other, though, is, has a longer term aspect to it, which is the argument that the United States is in decline and that the American pocket Americana is being replaced by a Pax Sinica, or that what we're going to see is the uh, is that China will replace or surpass the United States. And uh, that would have been true uh, whether there was Trump or not. Uh, so let me try to address each of these, and then we'll try to summarize it or put it together. If you look at uh, the question of uh, how we got where we are, it's worth noticing that um, the order that we see uh, in which the United States plays a significant role um, is new in the sense that it starts uh, in about 1945. Traditionally, people thought of order as being related to the behavior of the largest state. Remember, in the 19th century, we talked about Pax Britannica. Um, it didn't mean that Britain controlled the whole world, despite uh, the empire. Uh, but it did mean that there were certain things which Britain defended, which became global public goods meaning it was good for Britain, but good for others, and you couldn't exclude others from it. And that, uh, that uh, a good example of that would be freedom of the seas. Uh, Britain promoted freedom of the seas because it wanted more ocean to float the Royal Navy around, and because it had the biggest navy. So it didn't do it out of the uh, goodness of its heart, but if the largest country has an interest in a global public good, others can benefit uh, as well as the promoter. And when there's no country that promotes a large public good, uh, you have a breakdown of order. And the interesting thing about the order that we have today is it didn't start when the United States became the world's largest economy. In fact, the world's largest economy title goes to the United States in about 1900. 
Uh, and so it's a long time after that before you get the so-called liberal international order or the uh, Pax Americana. Uh, in 1900, the U.S. was still thinking primarily in hemispheric terms. Uh, it, it, uh, its orientation was toward uh, the Western Hemisphere. Some people would say we hid behind the British Navy, uh, but so be it. We, we followed the advice of George Washington, which was to avoid entangling alliances. And the global balance of power was obviously centered in Europe, and uh, we tried to refrain from the involvement in that global balance of power. That changes in 1917, when Woodrow Wilson uh, decides that uh, we can no longer uh, follow that policy, given various things that Germany had done, and uh, he sends two million Americans to fight in Europe, which tips the balance in World War I, a, a, a very transformative time in American foreign policy. But the Americans don't stay. After Wilson tries to follow the victory in World War I with a new form of international politics, a uh, League of Nations, which is enshrined in the Treaty of Versailles, uh, he goes home, he can't sell it to the United States Senate. The U.S. fails to ratify the Treaty of Versailles or to join the League of Nations, and the net result is the U.S. turns inward. So that in the 1930s, uh, as we see the effects of the Great Depression and the difficulties that Britain was facing, uh, Britain no longer has the power to provide global public goods, whether it be freedom of the seas or a stable monetary system or a relatively open international trading system. Uh, it's been too weakened by World War I. The United States is now uh, the strongest economy and potentially could be the global uh, leader in terms of the balance of power. But it goes to the period of virulent isolationism, uh, thinking that it's Woodrow Wilson made a huge mistake in 1917. And the net result of that is what W.H. Auden called the 1930s, a low dishonest decade, which was marked by a deep depression where one out of four people were out of work. It was marked by uh, a genocide and it was marked by the onset of World War II. So there essentially was no one providing or capable of providing leadership in the 1930s. The United States learned a lesson from that, so that in 1945 it did not make the same mistake of after the victory in World War II of returning home. It started to, it tried a bit, but the real turning point there was in 1947 when uh, Britain tells uh, the United States it can no longer afford to police the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there was a p p problem of whether the communists were going to take over in Greece and Turkey. Uh, at that point, the communists were controlled by the Soviet Union. There was a feeling that this was going to tip the balance of power, and Truman decided uh, to step in in Britain's role, uh, something sometimes called the Truman Doctrine. And that was followed the year after, in 1948, by the Marshall Plan to help restore the economies in Europe, followed in 49 by NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, in 1950, the UN led, uh, U.S. led a U.N. coalition to repulse North Korea's crossing the 38th parallel. And that really is the beginning of what's called the Pax Americana or the liberal international order. Now, again, before the 2016 election, that was a consensus in American politics. We had lots of differences over foreign policy. Vietnam was an example, Iraq is an example, but they were about the issue of intervention 
in less developed countries. In, in that time, until 2016, no major presidential candidate ever challenged the basic premises of 1945. So Donald Trump was the first person to say the whole thing is wrong. Uh, and that is something I'll come to. But let me first ask, if Trump hadn't been elected, if there were no Donald Trump, would we be seeing the end of the American era? In any case, and there are many people who thought yes. For example, if you read uh, uh, Philip Stevens or Martin Wolf in the Financial Times, both uh, admirable columnists, uh, they were writing in 2015, in other words, well before uh, the election of Trump, that the United States was declining, that this order couldn't persist, that uh, uh, you would basically see the rise of China uh, because of the U.S. decline. Now, that raises an interesting question, uh, how, which we ought to deal with before we turn to Trump. Is the U.S. in decline? Well, one of the problems is that the word decline is a rather ambiguous term. Uh, sometimes people think that there are natural life cycles of nations. For example, Horace Walpole, the British statesman of the 18th century, after uh, Britain lost its North American colonies, Walpole said, woe is Britain, we're now reduced to a miserable little island like Sardinia. Um, what he didn't foresee was that Britain was on the eve of its second century, fueled by the Industrial Revolution, indeed greater power, not less. So judging uh, the fate or trajectory of a nation's lifespan, is very different from judging that of a human being. Uh, I can assure you, for example, particularly if you look up my birth date, that I am in decline. But I can't assure you that the United States or any other country is in decline. Uh, if you think of decline, you want to distinguish between absolute decline and relative decline. Uh, absolute decline is what happened to ancient Rome. For example, if you look at uh, the problems of, uh, of Rome, it, it had no productivity in its economy, and it succumbed not to the rise of a new empire, Persia or Germany or whatever, it succumbed to hordes of barbarians and internecine warfare. And so when people read editorials in which they say, the American empire is like the Roman empire and it's in those final days. Um, that doesn't really fit the facts very well. It's hard to make a case for absolute decline in America despite the problems the country has. Let me give you a few basic long-term trends. These are things that persist beyond the decade of Trump or whatever. Take, for example, um, demography. Uh, if you look at the population of, in the world today, the three largest countries are China, India, U.S. And U.N. demographers say if you project out to 2050, mid-century, it will be India, China, and U.S. What's remarkable is that the U.S. is the only developed country which is going to hold its position in terms of demographic ranking. And that makes a difference in terms of the dependency ratio. In other words, how many people are productive workers as opposed to old people or young people who depend upon those productive workers. So demographically, the US has got a good long-term uh, trend. If you look at energy, if we were here 10 years ago, uh, you'd say, well, the U.S. is becoming hopelessly dependent upon Middle Eastern oil, and uh, that is sapping its power. Uh, that didn't anticipate the shale revolution, in which the technology of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling was applied to shale rock that had been there forever, 
Uh, but it has produced a situation where the United States and North America are likely to be largely independent of imports from outside the continent. And uh, uh, that is in sharp contrast to China, which is increasingly dependent upon it, Middle Eastern oil. Or take a third um, uh, a measure of sort of long-term trends, uh, trying to go beyond the Trumpian visions, things that are, that are uh, 10 years or so. Uh, ask yourself, what are the major technologies of the century that we're in? And people will generally say it's biotechnology, nanotechnology, and the next generation of information technology, including big data and artificial intelligence. And then ask what country is at the forefront of all these technologies? It's the U.S. And you say, ah, oh, but can it continue when it's in such uh, difficult turmoil and so forth? Well, look at the university structure. According to Shanghai Jiao Tong University, which does a ranking of universities globally, of the top 20 universities in the world, 15 of the top 20 are in the United States, and none are in China. I think Tsinghua uh, uh, comes out about 42nd or something. But, but the point is, that it's, if you ask, is the United States in absolute decline, these are not the characteristics I mentioned about ancient Rome. These are, are beneficial long-term trends, uh, and they are going to, they, they are more than just the current politics that I'm trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say that's an absolute decline. I think the answer is no. What about relative decline? Relative decline suggests that if a country may be doing well, but somebody else is doing even better, then you can have relative decline. That would be the case of the Netherlands in the 17th century. You look at your Rembrandts and you'll see a very prosperous society. But at the same time, Britain was replacing the Dutch as the dominant sea power, in the, particularly in the North Sea and elsewhere. And uh, so there was a relative decline of the Netherlands, even though the, it wasn't an absolute decline. And uh, so we're thinking about relative decline. One has to say, well, who would pass the United States? What are the alternatives? And sometimes people say, well, the biggest is Europe. And when Europe acts as an entity, the European economy is as large or larger than the United States. The problem is there's a big if statement there, if Europe acts as an entity. And as we know, that's something of a problem. Uh, the other candidate might be Russia, um, which had been a superpower in the Cold War. But if you look at Russia, there you see a situation where you can make a case for decline. Demographically, it's in decline, and it has not escaped its dependence on energy as the basis of the economy. Two-thirds of Russian exports are oil and gas. So that the ad adaptation that you need to, if you want an information-based economy, Russia has lagged. Uh, the other possibility would be India, which as I mentioned earlier, will be the largest country in terms of population. And uh, India is uh, making progress, 7% growth, but it still has a long way to go. It's a $2 trillion economy, the US is about a $20 trillion economy. And the key for India will be if it learns to use its underutilized human resources. And about a third of Indian women are illiterate. That's a huge portion of your population to waste uh, uh, if you're going to rise to the top. I hope India will solve that problem, but it's not about to pass the US on these things. So that leaves us really with one contender, which is China. And there the question is, well, is China about to pass the US? And I think the, there's a great deal of, uh, of uh, hype about China. China has done an extraordinarily good job of raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And it's a very impressive record. Um, 
but China is still uh, has a, quite some distance to go. I, uh, as Chinese will tell you, um, you know, it looks great in some dimensions, but there are others which aren't. There's some areas, I mean, I was teaching at Tsinghua last uh, December, and I took the Chinese bullet train down to, to uh, Shandong and so forth. And I wish the Chinese would give technical assistance to the United States on railways. But, but in terms of overall power, I don't see China replacing the U.S. Uh, right now, if you measure the economy by purchasing power parity, uh, you can get an argument that China is larger than the U.S., but you don't buy oil or machines with purchasing power parity. You buy it with currency, and in currency, current exchange rates, the U.S., as I said, is a $20 trillion economy. China is about a $12 trillion economy. At some point, China will be larger because of the size of its population, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be more powerful. In terms of military power, the United States uh, has a budget in the range of four times as large as China's, plus the fact that uh, uh, in soft power, while China has made some progress, uh, it, most rankings of China in terms of soft power lag well behind. So the view that China's are just about to pass the U.S. and we should be very fearful, I think, is a great mistake. I have a colleague who's written a book called Destined for War, saying that the Thucydides trap will get us, and it's going to be like Britain and Germany in, uh, in 1914. You remember that uh, Thucydides' great explanation, uh, the Peloponnesian War was, was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta, and World War I on this account is caused by the rise in the power of Germany and the fear it created in Britain. Uh, and that essentially was cataclysmic for that century. So if you believe in this, you might say, well, our century, the 21st, will be torn apart by the rise in the power of China and the fear it creates in the US. Uh, the problem with this, there are lots of problems with it, but one of the problems is that Germany had already passed Britain in industrial strength by 1900, uh, 14 years before the war broke out. Uh, if you take the measures I suggested and that are, are detailed in a book I wrote called Is the American Century Over? Um, China is not about to pass the US in overall power. And that means we have time to manage this relationship and that the great danger I see is not that, that we're destined for war, but that we forget that that Thucydides proposition has two parts to it, the rise of and the fear it creates. And will China rise? Yes. Do we have to succumb to hysteria? No. And I think if we can keep a balanced sense of how to respond to China, we'll be all right. I used to uh, uh, talk about this with Lee Kuan Yew, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, and, I, and he was a shrewd observer of both the United States and China. And uh, I asked him what he thought. He said he thought China would give the United States a run for its money. It would continue to do well, to rise, and so forth. He said, but they're not going to pass you. And I said, why? He said, because while China can draw upon the talents of 1.3 billion people, the U.S. can draw upon the talents of 7.5 billion people and recombine them with a diversity which is far more creative than is possible with ethnic Han nationalism. This, of course, a comment by an ethnic Han. Um, and I think there's something in that. If the U.S. can keep to its principles of openness, uh, we can manage a relationship with China and not have to succumb to fear. But, and that brings me to part two of our problem of whether the liberal international order is over or not, which goes to the 2016 election and the role of Donald Trump. 
Um, what we see here is that uh, as somebody, I guess it was Kishore Mabubani, a Singaporean diplomat, he said, if we're going to see the death of the liberal international order, it's not going to be by murder by China, it's going to be by suicide by the United States. And that argues that the rise of Trump is more of a problem than the rise of China. So if we look at, at this, how do we understand Trump? Trump is a distinctive personality uh, and a type we've never seen before in, in American politics. He has a very short attention span, a very tightly focused narcissistic fo uh, perspective on things, and but is an extraordinary skillful communicator. His mentality is shaped partly by the New York real estate market, which is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You know, it's sometimes said if, if uh, in New York real estate, if you do a bargain with somebody and they walk away from the table and they're still smiling, it means you've left money on the table. You failed. So, you know, it's, it's a zero-sum view of the world. And Trump has that, and his attitudes reflect a protectionist and nationalist uh, approach to things. But even more important in the formation of Trump's approach is his experience as a reality TV star. And what he learned from reality TV is the secret to success is to keep the camera focused on you. And you get the camera to focus on you by being outrageous. And when people start complaining about your outrage and checking you, so the Washington Post will follow a Trump speech with a you know, fact check and put down the number of Pinocchios and so forth, by the time that's in the print, you've gone on to the next outrage and the next outrage and the next outrage. It's like uh, if a dog is snapping at your heels, you throw a bone, the dog runs after it, and if it comes back too soon, you throw another bone. And that's the way Trump treats the press, and he's quite successful at it. And that's the role of Twitter and tweets. Uh, you know, you could say, how can a president do this? And the answer, he does it to be disruptive and to control the agenda. And frankly, though I don't uh, like the content, he's been surprisingly successful in that. I mean, we shouldn't underestimate his ability to have controlled the agenda. Um, so the question we have to ask is, what's the effect of Trump? If you look at this week's Economist, it has a picture uh, on the cover, which is rather amusing, of uh, uh, Trump sitting on a wrecking ball that's swinging and then you realize that the wrecking ball is the planet. And uh, The Economist raises the question, I, I rather like the article because I'm quoted in it, but aside from that, it raises a good question, which is uh, what, if we step back from our usual way of looking at things, is it possible that by departing from the conventional wisdom, by being outrageous, he will do things which other leaders have not been able to do. So, for example, um, he has defied the conventional wisdom on the issue of North Korea, and he's meeting right now in Singapore. Um, he has defied the conventional wisdom on Iran and pulled out of the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran. He's defied the conventional wisdom on trade. And he's not only applied tariffs against our allies, but he's also tried to push China to give up its exploitative approach to transfer of intellectual property. In other words, the, the idea that you coerce firms into giving up their intellectual property. And the argument that they make is that if Trump succeeds in two out of three of those big issues, maybe people who are the conventional wisdom, such as I am, uh, will have to admit we're wrong. That, uh, that his disruptive tactics, his wrecking ball approach, his totally, uh, uh, what we see as non-strategic approach, if it succeeds in those things, then maybe we would have to step back and say we're wrong. Frankly, I 
doubt that's going to happen. I mean, if you ask me on North Korea, I think what you're going to get is a cosmetic solution. And we've had cosmetic solutions, which means a promise to denuclearize in the past, and the North Koreans have violated. On uh, China, I think uh, it's very easy to show that the Chinese-U.S. bilateral trade balance has changed if China just buys a lot of agricultural products and oil and gas. But it's like pushing a balloon. You push it in here, it pops out somewhere else. It isn't a real solution to the nature of the, of the trade problem with China. And if you, uh, so, but you may get a cosmetic solution, which he can brag as having reduced this uh, imbalance. And on Iran, it's very hard to see that if, even if there was a uh, collapse of the Iranian government um, as a result of the reimposition of sanctions, that this would actually produce a democratic regime. So I would think the probabilities of his accomplishing two out of three of these big issues through his uh, disruptive tactics are pretty slight. However, uh, even if he does, there's something else to notice, which is in doing so, in trying to change or disrupt the conventional wisdom, he has basically broken the system that has produced global public goods for the last 70 years. And that may turn out to be extremely costly. And if we don't get something that works as a big success in compensation, we'll wind up uh, with the wrecking balls wreckage rather than with these big wins or big victories. Another way of putting it, is Trump does not in the least understand soft power or the importance of attraction. And there are an increasing number of issues in international politics in which the solution can't be done by power over others. It has to be power with others. Take climate change. There's no way power over another country can solve climate change. I suppose you could say, China builds more coal-burning plants. We could destroy them with drones or cruise missiles. But that's far-fetched, to put it mildly. And if we are serious about climate change, and it is a serious problem, we're going to have to work with China. We can't solve it without China. China can't solve it without us. And there are going to be more issues like this of international monetary stability, uh, dealing with pandemics, setting rules of the road for cyber as we enter the era of artificial intelligence, which are going to take cooperation, which means attracting others to develop networks and institutions. And that's what the wrecking ball is destroying. And so we may wind up in terms of the liberal international order, uh, essentially, as Mabubani said, uh, dying because of the ambitions of a president who is going for the big win, uh, doesn't get the big win, and in the meantime leaves a considerable wreckage behind him. I hope that's not the case, obviously, um, but as an analyst and observer, I have to be honest in saying that I can't totally rule it out. If I was to look for some hope it might be looking back to the period of uh, the 60s, which were an even more difficult period in American politics than the current period. Um, and there, it, in the period of the Vietnam War, the American government was wildly unpopular. People were marching in the streets around the world, uh, protesting the government's policy. But what's interesting is they were not singing the Communist Internationale. They were singing Martin Luther King's We Shall Overcome. So there was an aspect of American civil society which was generating a soft power which was able to transcend that decade and to be there and to restore in the 70s and later. So it's possible that this period 
now we're at the era of Trump, uh, where we have a clear, de a measurable decline in American soft power and a danger of a certain wreckage that we may be able to recover from it. We're not sure, but at least there's some degree of precedent historically. So I would say, uh, you know, people ask me, am I optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I say both. Um, I can see a world in which things could get worse, but I also uh, suspect that they may at some point get better. And for those who say we've never seen it so bad, um, I would ask you to go back and reread the 1960s where we had three assassinations of major figures, two Kennedys and uh, Martin Luther King, in which we had riots in the streets, uh, burning down of cities. My own building at Harvard was bombed by radical students. Um, whatever the problems we have now, they're not quite that bad. So I'll come out slightly on the more optimistic side of my optimism-pessimism balance. Uh, but I stand uh, ready to be corrected by any of you, and we'll turn to that now. So thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Professor Nye, for what has been an extremely interesting and enlightening address. We'll now move on to a question and answer session. Professor Nye, the geopolitical issue that is arguably on everyone's minds today is the Trump-Kim summit, which is being hosted in Singapore as we speak. What do you think are the prospects for a deal being struck during the summit or for substantial progress on the denuclearization issue being made? Well, it, uh, the two parts to your question uh, uh, will receive a different answer from me. Uh, I think they will probably find something which will look like a deal. And I think that's because it's in the interests of both of them as leaders. Um, Trump wants to have a great success. To, he claims he wants a Nobel Prize and so forth. Um, and Kim Jong-un, who has really outplayed the United States brilliantly, uh, has decided that uh, having established that he can have an impact militarily. He then turned uh, to peace by going to the Olympics uh, in, in South Korea, and that earned him not only uh, the accolades uh, of South Korean, but also Trump's willingness to meet with him and also Xi Jinping, who had tried to ignore him for the first couple of years, also had to pay attention. So Kim goes into this, uh, having won the first hand of this poker game, he is now accepted as a de facto nuclear weapon state and gets an, a, a, an audience with the American president, um, which is what he always wanted. So for Kim to allow this to blow up would be a mistake from his tactics. And for Trump to allow it to blow up, um, I think it's unlikely he'll allow it to blow up. So I think that they will probably declare victory. Now, that's different from the second half of your question is, will it lead to real denuclearization? I think the prospects of the Kim regime or Kim Jong-un giving up what the Kim family has spent 30 years doing is a close to zero. Nothing's ever zero in this world. I'd let's say asymptotic to zero. So I think what you'll get is a cosmetic agreement in which Kim will say, we will promise to dismantle all our nuclear weapons and we'll start next year by allowing the IAEA to come in and and uh, dismantle a weapon or two, and you can have CNN there, so forth. And uh, he'll still have about 38 left. And, uh, but he'll promise he'll give all those up within 10 years. In the meantime, uh, Trump will have his Nobel Prize, and Kim will be able to turn toward uh, his agenda of trying to uh, 
uh, open up the economy a little bit. So I, my bet would be that you'll have a, some sort of a cosmetic agreement. Um, now, a cosmetic agreement is better than war. But, uh, but are we really facing denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? I don't believe it for a minute. Okay. 28 years ago, you coined the term soft power to represent the ability of nations to shape the preferences of other actors through appeal and attraction in international politics. Has the importance of soft power changed since you first wrote that book? And which country, in your opinion, has been the most effective, of soft power in re most effective user of soft power in recent years? Well, the term has certainly um, taken on a political currency, which I never expected. Um, uh, when Hu Jintao told the 17th Party Congress in 2007 that China should invest more in soft power, uh, it surprised me very much. And China has spent billions on soft power. Uh, in terms of which country is most successful, um, there's a index of soft power which is uh, comp uh, compiled by a consultancy, Portland, in London. They're going to issue the next version of it on July 12th, I believe. And uh, uh, they ranked, last year, they ranked France as number one. The year before that, it was the US. The year before that, it was Britain. Uh, these countries are all within the same striking range of each other. I mean, the, the China is ranked about 26. So despite its investments, I don't think China has uh, made a huge jump up the rankings. But also it's worth noticing that some small countries do very well with soft power. I would say Norway, Singapore, for example, have been quite successful on uh, and as the saying goes, punching above their weight because of their ability to attract. Um, well, in the interest of time, I'll open up um, to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you. Uh, please stand up and ask your question. So the first question will go to the gentleman in the gray shirt in the second row. My question comes in two parts. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your speech. Um, but there was a little thing that I had a question about within it is, the distinction between US hegemony and the liberal world order. So the first part of the question is about ideology. During the Cold War, there was a competing ideology. Somebody had something else they wanted to propose, and even in the Brezhnev era, when people started to have questions about it, the, the de facto policy was go out into the third world and spread this stuff. But nobody seems to be doing that today. So given that nobody's doing that today, what would it look like to have a different world order? Who would run it, and on what basis would they run it? And could the current world order be persi persist without the US as its hegemony? Well, it's a great question. Um, unlike the 1930s, in which communism and fascism posed real alternative approaches, and if, for example, Hitler had won in World War II, or if Stalin had won the Cold War, the world order we're seeing today would look very, very different. Uh, China, to my mind, doesn't pose that kind of existential threat. And unlike the Germans or the Soviets, who essentially wanted to kick over the table, China simply wants to get more winnings on the table. Uh, it wants a bigger pile of chips in front of China. The last thing it wants is to knock over the whole table. And that leads me to believe that China can be brought into a world order. It won't be an American world order. Obviously, China wants China's interests. And it won't be very liberal in the sense of democracy and human rights. Xi Jinping has warned against being entrapped in uh, Western ideas. But if you ask, is it plausible that China could help to uh, uh, keep an international trade system, an international monetary system, a global commons, which could include uh, climate, uh, dealing seriously with climate change and so forth. We're beginning to see that. In other words, China, Xi Jinping himself has said, um, we have benefited from this order. Now, they don't want it to be an American world order, but they're not afraid to kick over the table. 
So I think the hope that one would have is that in the future, the Americans would learn to work with the Chinese on a number of these things, and the Chinese would learn that they're not going to be able to expel the Americans from Asia or to have complete hegemony over the region, and that in terms of global power, they're not about to replace the United States. So the prospects for imagining a world order in which China focuses on increasing its earnings, its pile of chips, but doesn't kick over the table, I think is quite good if we play our cards the right way. Uh, but that's where Trump comes in. Uh, I don't know that he will play our cards the right way. I suspect that he may not. There's an interesting study uh, just completed this year by the Rand Corporation called China and World Order, which basically says what I just said without the comment about Trump. Um, actually, as a follow-up question, um, you mentioned in your speech that uh, an alternative perhaps um, to the US would be Europe, uh, especially working in unity. But obviously with Brexit, there's a big question mark about uh, the future of the EU. Do you think that um, other states, uh, special, especially regional powers, are going to in the future move towards more uh, international orders or are going to start acting uh, more independently? Okay. Well, Europe uh, has a role to play in world order. Um, if you look at uh, some areas such as uh, privacy and uh, the issues of uh, how we handle uh, the internet, Europe really has, uh, with its GDPR, um, taken the lead. And similarly with raising questions of antitrust in relation to the, to the giants in the cyber world, the giants are American companies but they need access to the European market and European regulators therefore have a good deal of power. So I, I, think it, I don't think we should write off Europe just because it doesn't right now have the degree of unity that it's had uh, aspired to. Um, I don't know what's going to be the long run relation of Britain and Europe. Indeed, I don't think Theresa May knows that. But uh, I, think the, uh, I think what's most striking is that despite the current Euro pessimism, the European idea has proved more resilient than most people have given it credit for. And uh, you get cycles of Euro optimism and Euro pessimism. And uh, we're now in a cycle of Euro pessimism. But I think it's a big mistake to write off Europe. Europe can do its part in some areas to preserve a rules-based international system. Thank you. Um, next question, we will go to the hand all the way in the back. Yeah, yeah standing right there, yeah. Thank you, Professor Nye. In light of your criticism of the potential outcome of the uh, current US-North Korea summit, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on the value of the Iran nuclear agreement, how that differs from the comedic solution you've just critiqued, and specifically on President Trump's decision to withdraw from the agreement. I think Trump made a terrible mistake in withdrawing from the Iran nuclear agreement. I think it was a way to make sure that we had inspection and of Iran's nuclear program and that it uh, uh, delayed the process of, of developing enrichment capability. And uh, Iran has had a nuclear weapons program for a long time, since the days of the Shah. And uh, this essentially, so when people say, ah, but they have a nuclear weapons program, well, that, so what else is new? What this did was get a negotiated agreement for delay, and Iran was still a member of the non-proliferation treaty promising not to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, whereas North Korea in 1993 broke its promises under the non-proliferation treaty and exited the treaty. So I think Trump made a huge mistake in, in departing from the Iran agreement. If I could just follow up very quickly, um, is it not the case that Iran has on multiple occasions violated the terms of the nuclear agreement, especially with regard to international monitors? 
Well, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the answer to that is no. Uh, most of the complaints which Trump and the administration made were not about the details of compliance with the JCPOE. They were about Iran's continuing to develop missiles and Iran's interference politically in Syria and other areas in the so-called Shia Crescent. Uh, so as I understand the, uh, you know, uh, the facts is reported in the press, I don't have access to classified intelligence, it was not the uh, breaking of the agreement, it was the surroundings of the agreement and there was a dispute about with, between the US and its European allies about whether we should basically honor an agreement. Trump said it's the worst agreement ever, and, but it was because it didn't cover these other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question. We will go to um, the first hand in the second row, closest to me. Again, thank you for your talk. Uh, a lot of the thinking on the liberal international order in the face of a potential U.S. turn inwards has been that the institutions set up by the United States would self-perpetuate because the, or, or the member states within those institutions uh, is it's in their self-interest to perpetuate those institutions. Do you think that is a viable prospect for continuing the liberal world order, or do you think that there needs to be a strong enforcement power like the United States there in order for the liberal world order to continue? I think you might get uh, a patchwork quilt type arrangement. Madeleine Albright uh, has written a book in which she says of the possible dangers that worry her most is that the United States will return to its position of the 1930s, that it will become a free rider again, and therefore global public goods will not be produced. Um, I think there'll be, in fact, I think that's too pessimistic. I think there'll be some areas where the United States will continue to play a major role on public goods. Take Law of the Sea, for example, where the Navy definitely, like the British Navy of the 19th century, wants to keep the ability to have maximal freedom. Um, so there'll be some areas uh, where the U.S. will continue to play a lead. Uh, and also, if you look at public opinion polls in the U.S., it doesn't show a 1930s-style isolationism. In other words, it, you, the Pew polls, which measure attitudes toward international positions, uh, show that the majority of the American people want a more internationalist foreign policy. Um, so I don't think you're going to see a return to the 30s completely, but you may see some areas, for example, in trade, which turn out to be more protectionist, and the WTO may be severely damaged by the decisions taken by the Trump administration uh, this spring. Uh, so that's what I mean by patchwork. There'll be some areas where uh, things will be bad, other areas where they won't be as bad, and then there'll be the question of, will some countries be able to step in? For example, on human rights issues, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, leadership may come from other countries, may come from Europe, or from uh, Scandinavian countries, and so forth. So even if the US isn't uh, playing the role it has in the past, it may be you'll have a patchwork. I don't expect that we're going to return to a full 1930 scenario. Thank you. We have time for one final question, and we'll go to um, the lady in the white shirt. Thank you again. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask what you see the role of diplomats being um, in promoting soft power abroad in an era, in a Trumpian era, where the executive has an increasingly prominent platform, particularly in light of uh, digital connectivity. Um, one of the sad things about the effect of the Trump administration has been the um, downgrading of diplomacy and the gutting of the State Department. <coughs> Uh, the uh, first Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, uh, 
wanted to make reforms to the State Department. He didn't get on all that well with Trump um, and got fired for that, but he hadn't defended the State Department as such. In addition, a number of Republicans with great experience in, let's say, the Bush administration came out in the 2016 campaign and signed a letter uh, which said that Trump was not fit to be president. These are called the Never Trump Republicans. Many of those people had been high officials in previous Republican administrations and would have been expected to have uh, been the top political personnel in the State Department. Uh, a good example of this would be Robert Zellick, who uh, was president of the World Bank, but had been deputy secretary of state under uh, George W. Bush. So the fact that Tillerson uh, wasn't able to protect the State Department, that he wanted to reorganize the State Department uh, and therefore left open a number of positions and that the White House often vetoed positions that he had meant that you had a considerable exodus of people with diplomatic skills. Uh, I mean, there's always some exodus in the American system when uh, administrations change, but this was much worse than usual. And uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has said, or said when he first took over as secretary, that it was his intent to restore the role of the State Department in diplomacy. Um, but we haven't seen that yet. And Secretary of Defense Mattis, who is a former general, has told the Congress that if they don't provide the funds necessary for diplomacy in the State Department, and they allow American soft power to deteriorate, they're gonna to have to buy him more bullets. So there are people in the administration who want to restore the role of diplomacy. It's not clear that those include uh, the president. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join us in thanking Professor Joseph Mack. <laughs>